Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is. I am Peter Whittle. Now, I'm delighted today that my guest is somebody who's usually on the other side of an interview. Colin Brazier is one of the main faces on the new GB News Channel. Of course, it's been going now for about four months. He originally uh, started to fill in for Andrew Neil, uh, and then when Andrew Neil left, uh, he took over full time, uh, and the show is called Brazier, and it's at eight o'clock on GB News. Uh, he's a journalist of very long standing. He was at Sky for 24 years, and indeed won an international Emmy for his coverage of the 2015 migration crisis in Europe. Um, thank you very much for joining us. No, Peter, thanks for thank inviting me. It's very really kind. Um, it's been quite a roller coaster, hasn't it, over the past four months? <laughs> uh, are things settling down? I think they are. Yeah. I think they are. Roller coaster, my. It's been some roller coaster. Um, it, there's a period of consolidation, I think, just beginning to bed in. Uh, the, the first few weeks were, I think, as Andrew Neil said in his interview with the Daily Mail, at times fairly traumatic. I think that's true of many a startup. Um, there were obvious technical challenges. People, some people found that comical. Being on the receiving end of them wasn't. Uh, but we've learned quickly. We've put right uh, some of the mistakes as, as well as we can. There were obvious technical lim limitations at the beginning, and I think a lot of those problems have been put to bed now. I think the product is beginning to look genuinely mm. really quite solid. Yes. Were you surprised uh, by the level of hostility from certain areas to GB News? I mean, you know, from the moment it was announced, I mean, maybe you weren't surprised, but I mean, is, particularly if you're on Twitter and these sort of uh, <laughs> platforms, you know, it, it, people were gunning for it. Yeah. They? No, th the end of that first week, Peter, I, mean, I, I went for dinner on the Friday evening and I found myself saying it's been an absolute media phenomenon this week. And there was something of the, the phenomenon about it. Uh, the reaction was out of all proportion with our influence. It was um, bucket loads of free advertising in a way we couldn't possibly have dreamed of. I mean, clearly some of it was damaging, some of it was venomous, uh, some of it stuck. Um, but to have joined the national conversation in the way we did was uh, an absolute revelation and certainly confirmed me in my view that what we were doing was necessary and vital. I mean, the reaction spoke to that, didn't yeah. it, I think? This is a quite a new departure in a way for you, isn't it? In the sense that you do these monologues, which actually most people with their programs do do a monologue at the mm. beginning, don't they? Uh, which is, I suppose, it's more common in America. Um, have you found that liberating to do? Totally. <laughs> <laughs> totally liberating and, and almost mysterious, yeah. actually. I mean, there are times when, uh, I mean, I did one last week which had 200,000 views on Twitter. Uh, about Greta Thunberg, but it was really about the Industrial Revolution, about our sense of ingratitude that some people have for the amazing achievements of this tiny country, which has yielded and produced quite some, so many industrial and technical breakthroughs. But actually, as with all writing, Peter, you know yourself, anybody who writes in whatever capacity, occasionally there are, there are moments of alchemy which you can't expect and the words come out exactly right and the sentiments are expressed in just the most crystallised way imaginable. It happens about once a week, once a fortnight, I don't know how often, but this time it really did. And, and it takes, and it, catches fire yeah. and it's um it is wonderful to see people <clears throat> invest you know five minutes of their time it's a lot of time in a yeah. crowded internet space to look at this thing pass the words perhaps be presented with an original idea or two and that's an, an, an amazing feeling of liberation i mean more generally uh having been at sky for a long time and had to be you know as balanced as was necessary in that environment. It, it's quite an adjustment. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, emerging from the, you know, cracking open the cocoon yes. uh, is, a, is, is, is tough. Twitter was the key for me. I had three months between leaving Sky and joining GB News, pretty much, where I was able to uh, find my voice. And it was found on Twitter, for better right. or for worse. Right. I saw you do one, we're filming this on Thursday, the 7th of October, and I saw you do one this week about Keith Blakelock. Mm. It was a monologue. It was the anniversary of his death. Now, for people who don't uh, know, this is a policeman who was uh, murdered on the Broadwater farm estate in the 1980s. Um, I thought uh, you, you, I thought that was a very brave 
bit you did there, actually, because you're talking about it was essentially a kind of race murder of a policeman, yeah. Yeah. and yet, as I know, people don't know about it. Yeah, no, they don't, and and it's. It, we're not suggesting, I certainly wasn't suggesting, that somehow he was a victim of a, of a race killing. We can't prove, nor would I seek to prove, that he was killed because he was white. He was killed because he was a police yeah. officer. And the perpetrators who haven't been caught were black. And it's the having been caught that's the important thing. His family aren't, uh, so far as I can tell, uh, yelling at the Home Secretary, no justice, no peace. They've gone quietly because you accept as the wife, the children of a serving police officer killed in action, that occasionally this sort of thing happens. <clears throat> but when you consider the amount of attention given to you know, George Floyd's or whomever, even Stephen Lawrence, compared to what Keith Blakelock got, mm -hmm. and whenever he was talked about, it was always with these caveats about other things that had happened that set the whole thing in context. And as I said in the monologue, there is no context for hacking somebody to death, a fellow human being. There can be no apology. We can't get into apologetics for that kind of slaughter. Um, the, the defining moment for me, Peter, quite simply, is that three years ago I lost my wife and I was left with six children, um, dependent children, to bring up. And, and when that happens to you, um, it's quite hard to be offended by the, the slings and arrows of outrageous opinion. I, you know, I'm not saying I don't care about the opinions of my peers or the people I used to work with at Sky, uh, but it's certainly, I now have a perspective that I didn't have five years ago, for instance. She was very young, wasn't she? No, she was the opposite. She was actually older than me. I mean, she was, she was five years older than me. Yeah. Uh, she died of breast cancer in 2018. She was a journalist. She was um, she worked for Reuters and then lastly actually worked for Sky, which is where I met her. And um, she, she was a, a splenetic, energetic, wonderful, warm-hearted woman. Uh, somebody on Twitter actually only last week who clearly knew her uh, publicly tweeted and said she would be turning in her grave if she had seen what you've become, that you've taken the GB News shilling and you say the things she says. And I couldn't let it go, and I replied and just, you know, and said, actually, you've no idea what my late wife yes, thought about exactly. anything. But uh, well, we thought we... Well, look, we, the point is, we, 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 were, we were fellow travellers, yeah. ideologically. And three weeks before she died, uh, we, we were in a hospital car park. She'd been for a scan, which actually was quite a promising scan. It was a false dawn, as it turned out. We were sort of briefly buoyed by the results. And she turned to me, and this would have been in um, you know, uh, this was sort of the summer of 2018. And she turned to me and said, I might live to see Brexit. You know, so she, she had a deep conviction politically. Uh, she'd started, she'd used to be a member of the Revolutionary Communist Party. She was very thoughtful about politics. She became a, a, quite a, a, a fierce Brexiteer. Uh, and Brexit at that point, and actually before, almost became a sort of sacred duty. Um, so undeniably part of the risk that I've taken with six children still dependent on me to bring in you know make sure there are enough steaks in the freezer uh, is is for her uh, uh, and and that sense that sense of perspective having been through those those fires and that crucible of death if I can put it quite so dramatically uh, means that some of the the, the, the criticism is slightly waters off, water off a duck, oh, yes. duck's back. What are the age ranges of your children? Uh, 22, the eldest, oh, really? and the youngest is 12. So they're all really close together. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the, in my time at Sky, there were some things I felt I could get away with doing. Mm. Um, um, I used to take people I respected for lunch, people like Douglas Murray or James Dellingpole, and say, look, I can't tell you what I really feel, but I want you to know that I'm a great admirer and I think you're incredibly brave doing what you do. And the other thing I did was I felt there was, a, there, there was I couldn't say what I wanted to say about things um, of a more sensitive nature, but I could, I could focus on one thing that I felt in my own monomaniacal way was terribly important, which mm -hmm. is demography, and I still think it's incredibly important and massively underexplored. And I did demography. A, demography, and I did a, I did a, a pamphlet for uh, Civitas, who are in this, this very building, um, which was looking at the benefits of bigger families. So there were things, you know, I had been able to get some of these ideas out, yes. and of course a lot of that was based on the laboratory of my own very big family. Yes. But you also wrote a book about, about having big families, didn't well, you? Well, that, that was it. That was the, I called oh. it a pamphlet, but it was a book. Oh, right. It was, it was, a book. It was sticking up for siblings. Yeah. That's right. Okay. So what are the advantages now? Well, in the most direct way, I've seen them in the last three years. I mean, they, um, there's data, strong data, showing that when kids suffer 
loss, usually through divorce, mm. a parent leaves home, sometimes through death, uh, that siblings nourish each other and offer a support network that's not there if you are one of the growing number of only children. I mean, we're now in the UK in a situation where about half of all family units are an only child. And we know, and, and this is not to criticise them, we all know why it's happening, cost of childcare, housing, lost career momentum, all the rest of it. Um, but just to cite one example, um, when, when there's trouble, siblings do offer support uh, of the most obvious kind. Yes. Not always good. Yeah. You know, it can exacerbate bad family setups. It accentuates and is a vector for good family setups. Um, but there's, I mean, the data is quite strong in areas that you wouldn't expect. Maybe uh, obesity across the piece, speaking very generally. Clearly, there are lots of individual examples that run to counter it. But, but speaking very generally, if you have siblings, you're going to be fitter. Uh, this is adjusting socioeconomically. Really? Uh, well, because, you know, yeah, you, yeah. From, from a toddler, you are, yeah. there's a lot more kinetic activity going on. Yes. And basically, if you've got, you know, your oldest daughter's 22, then presumably she's almost acts well, like a mother, I suppose, for the other children at some point. Um, um, but, I mean, how, do you, how did you cope, uh, you know, with, with a family of six? Your wife gone. Carry on. That, that's an extraordinary uh, act to have to juggle, surely. Mm. Long moments of despair, Peter. Mm. <laughs> you know, um, I, they they keep you going, yes. don't they? I mean, you know, when uh, that, where's the choice? Mm. Where's the choice? I had a wonderful woman, Mary, who uh, came in to to clean and help me a couple of days a week and uh, cook for the kids sometimes, and. Um, she, uh, her dad died when she was 15. And, sorry, her mother died of breast cancer when she, when she was 15. And dad, her dad hit the bottle and essentially had a nervous breakdown. And she, she brought up her two younger siblings. And, uh, and she's helped me enormously with, with my own children yes. for a couple of days a week. Uh, so you're never doing these things wholly alone, obviously. It helped that my children were really close together in age. Um, you, you may ask yet about the sort of role of faith in all this. Of course, faith plays a part as well. My Catholic faith was part of it, uh, even as you are banging your head against the wall, thinking how and why and mm. you know, where does, how does this work? Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was the first six months in particular were really, really grim. And occasionally you'll st I'll still wake up, I'll be knocked side by, sideways by, a, by an incredibly uh, powerful dream. I mean, you know, I don't, mm. I don't think every day of Joe anymore. Um, but you know your subconscious is a is an amazing thing, and mm. um, and she tends to visit sometimes at night. You, you're quite a devout man. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say. I wouldn't say especially devout, Peter. I mean, <clears throat> I'll go to mass where, where where and when I can. I pray, uh, but I, you know there isn't a rosary rattling around in my pocket now. Mm. But, I mean, these things, in, <clears throat> in a way, all of our lives have become more political, haven't they? I mean, so, for example, to have faith is, is something that once would have been just a, something that you had or not. But now it sort of seems to become a political act. I mean, I, I don't mean in your case necessarily. But do you feel that Christians, Christianity is sort of persecuted now uh, in this country? When I say persecuted, I mean, you know, it is being downgraded at every opportunity, it seems to me. Mm. I, I agree, I agree. I, persecution, we can be a little bit parochial, can't we? We can obsess a little bit too much about what happens in our own country. And actually there is a difference between the producers of Coronation Street insisting for the wedding scene we remove the cross above the altar and the real persecution that Christians in Syria or China or parts of Africa really face, which is life and death stuff. Um, I found at Sky it became increasingly difficult in some strange ways. So for instance, um, the, the whole idea of a big family, I mean, having a big family for me is partly a reflection of my Catholic faith. And I remember at Sky, th th there was a, a time when they were running advertisements where over pop for, for, for part of their coverage, looking at environmentalism, and they were running a, a trailer, a promo, a promotional video, which had the word overpopulation writ large, and it was clearly a very bad thing. Mm. Uh, and I thought, well, this is, I'm, this is, I'm struggling with this a little bit because, yeah. you know, I yeah. quite like the idea of yeah. the injunction to go forth and multiply. And I think that it's an expression of romantic optimism of the best kind. Yes. Uh, and I think that a lot of our fears about overpopulation are overblown. And in more than half the world's countries don't have that problem. In fact, increasingly the opposite. 
Um, so you, my faith is also tied to my sense of my own vocation, which is journalistic as a father, but also as a father of a, a, a relatively large family. I mean, well, very untypical by Western standards now, as you say. Um, I mean, this is the point, surely, since you've made it there already, but uh, for huge parts of the world, um, this is normal behaviour, uh, normal family life. It's just that in the West, people have sort of, well, in some ways stopped having children, I mean, even. Uh, and I think you, you, you alluded to it there. Is this what happens when people no longer think about or have confidence in the future? I mean, it's not, some people say it's feminism, oh, it's just so expensive to have children. But I can't help feeling it's also, it's a vote of a lack of confidence in what's coming, isn't it? Well, I, I, <clears throat> there's a kind of nihilism, yes, certainly. Yes. And, uh, you know, I, I was really struck this week by Sajid Javid's speech at the Conservative Party mm. conference. And he floated this idea, which is easier for him, I suppose, having grown up as one of five children in a two-bedroom flat in Bristol, uh, in which he said, look, the idea that we let the state take care of everything, uh, but actually family has a key role to play uh, in provision of so so uh, social care, mm. health care more generally. <clears throat> we, we've lost that connection. You know, we, we've got to recapture the economic rents of parenthood, mm. which have existed for half a billion years. You know, that idea that you have children because in your dotage there's an expectation you'll be provided with some care. I mean... Some of these questions are, are, seem unconscionable, but need putting anyway. I mean, so for instance, uh, you know, why should I be paying an extra, you know, one and a half, one point two five percent on my national insurance bill uh, for an insurance policy, essentially for care in my care in, for elder care that may yet be provided by by my large brood of children that I've made some sacrifices to have course the answer comes back well you can't be sure your kids will take care of you so the insurance policy is there um, but there's an we see the iniquity don't we oh, yes. there is an iniquity and yeah. and to your point I mean there is <clears throat> we don't know where we're going to be in five years time ten years time but I've got a, a strong suspicion maybe you do have to as well Peter that that nihilism is going to have wings and it's got there's an ideology behind it the birth strike movement child free by uh, choice um, I think there'll be plenty of people who will subscribe to the sort of Harry version of demography, which, which actually they don't necessarily exemplify, but there's plenty of other people who will say, you know, we're not having children for the sake of the planet. Oh, yeah. And a great number of them just want to retain the two skiing holidays a year and make sure those nice cream carpets stay creamy. Mm -hmm. um, but you can't call people out on this stuff without being seen as that hideous, wacky, mm -hmm. God-bothering, judgmental so-and-so. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, no, there's... Uh, it's it's a bleak outlook in in that in that respect. I think uh, demographically speaking, were you you from Yorkshire? Aren't you? Mm, mm. Were you from a large family? Uh, well, eldest of three. Eldest of three. And, and you know, and Joe and I, my late wife, we didn't particularly set out to have a huge a huge family. Right. Um, there were lots of as with all fam families, they they have their own story as to why you end up where you end up. Um, it certainly was true <clears throat> that having had one, and then we struggled to have any more, uh, and actually it was quite hard then to get to readjust mentally from a, a mindset which was, you know, being pregnant, good. <laughs> um, yeah. But the, 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 the Catholic thing played a part of it unquestionably too. But also you, uh, it sounds like I'm, this is your life, um, but uh, <laughs> you, you, you did work on local papers, didn't you, the Northern Echo and the Yorkshire Post. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, would have been in the 80s? Uh, early 90s. Early yeah. 90s. Uh, this that sort of apprenticeship doesn't really happen anymore does it with journalism no i mean do, no. do 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 younger people do i mean if if a young person came to you now and said oh i'd really want to be a journalist or a broad, uh, well a broadcast mm, journalist or mm, a journalist mm. i mean would you be able to say yeah sure it's a fantastic thing i mean it seems to me that it's the doors are closing on people from different backgrounds really yeah yeah i mean on the narrow personal point you know i've said to the my kids forget it you know the eldest one's doing a master's in geology the next one's doing wants to be a doctor at Newcastle and and uh, uh, there's a possibility one of them's inclining towards journalism and I'll seek to dissuade I already have mm -hmm. sought to dissuade her because the, the business model is fundamentally broken 
uh, you know, the monopoly that, that journalists had on information has gone and anybody can take a picture and all, well, all the reasons we were familiar with. It's undeniably true journalism to a great degree has become a middle class hobby and that excludes working class kids who used to see it as a trade and all their experiences that they used to bring to bear with that particular perspective, red wall stuff, yes. um, the somewheres stuff has, has gone with them. When you, you started at Sky in, in 90, 97. 97, so it's a long time. Um, during that period, were you, did you see the media become more constricted in terms of, you know, its views? Uh, or did it, or was it just you that changed? I mean, mm -hmm. my, my impression, because I worked in television mm -hmm. myself for a long mm -hmm. time, my imp impression is that things have at the Overton windows, they call it, mm -hmm. has got narrower and now was that your experience when you were working in tv the, the narrow waistline the broad-mindedness may have swapped places maybe as yes. i got older that's natural i don't think so um the, the damascene moment was 2015 and you mentioned kindly the the international emmy um which uh, was a kind of sick joke peter really i mean I was in Greece, I was in uh, Serbia and Croatia covering the, the influx of migrants from Syria and, of course, elsewhere, actually predominantly elsewhere, as it turned out. And um, I had a couple of colleagues who were, were, were skept as sceptical, perhaps, as I was about what was happening. And what was happening was that a, a rinsed version of the truth was being presented by mainstream media, that there wasn't enough scepticism, that uh, you tended to go for that... Uh, pretty articulate English speaking uncovered woman from with a biomedicine degree from Damascus University rather than those slightly shifty shady looking characters in the background mm. always men who uh, didn't want to talk to you mm. couldn't speak English anyway so what's the point so we were presenting a really skewed narrative yeah uh, and it was the first time I really became aware uh, particularly on on the there was a flashpoint on the Serbian border Hungarian Serbian border when you know, right, uh, Victor Orban's shock troops, uh, as they'd be characterised, um, came under fire from missiles thrown by you know what's guys who look like young jihadis with their headscarves and lobbing bricks, uh, and yet this was presented in the evening news bulletins as the the, the, the vile thugs of Victor Orban uh, denying entry to these poor uh, huddled masses who simply wanted to you know uh, be, be be useful citizens in in Western Europe, and that for me was an absolute defining time. Uh, and I realised, sitting in an auditorium in New York, waiting for, for, for us to get the award, that that's, that's what, what it was all about. It was about p people in the industry all awarding each other baubles, you know. Um, it, it wasn't about satisfying viewer interest. It wasn't even about customers particularly much anymore. Yes, but isn't it, isn't it also a case that that sort of thing shows that journalists have become more like activists than reporters. Yes. yes. That's something that it seems so clear now. Totally, you know? totally. And to the point where actually you have a decision to make, don't you? I mean, for, I had a decision to make, which was I can either being carry, carry on being carried along uh, by, on this activist train, um, which was getting stronger at Sky. Uh, and, in, and in ways that people might not think are, are particularly worrying. I remember, you know, over a year ago, well over a year ago, got a call on my way into Sky. Um, we want to talk about the 8 o'clock bulletin. This was a Thursday. I was filling in for somebody else's show. We want to talk about the 8 o'clock bulletin. At 8 o'clock, it's Thursday. So you need to, uh, at, on the stroke of 8, move from your desk to the big news screen. And, uh, and then you're going to start applauding because everybody's clapping for carers. Um, and I said, Look, I, I'm really not doing that. You know, I do, we didn't stand and applaud for the last lot of heroes who came back from Afghanistan in coffins. So I'm, you know, it's not that I'm against clapping for carers or clapping for the NHS. I simply don't think we can maintain a, an iota of third party detachment. Mm -hmm. If we stand up there and start clapping and you take a picture of me, then you take a picture of Keir Starmer clapping and a picture of Boris clapping. Where's the separation? Mm -hmm. And, and this, uh, this seemed odd to the mm -hmm. person I was talking to. Mm -hmm. But for me, it was absolutely emblematic. Mm -hmm of the shift towards activism. Mm. But don't you find as well, I mean, it's the case, you know, whatever one's views on the pandemic, whatever one's views on the, on the lockdown, pros and cons, is that it seems that 
journalists didn't ask questions. I mean, you know, the big ones, for example, about China, where did this virus come from? Everything. You would think the questions would be asked. I mean, you know, whatever the answers might be, but they didn't even appear to be asked. You know, it was mm. almost like the media mm. had become this. Mm. I mean, I'm not. You know, it, it 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 might seem like a very easy thing to do to just simply you know blame the media, but I think increasingly uh, people, and I think you must surely be aware of this, people sort of see through it. They don't trust it, even in the way they might have done 15 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Would you? I mean, I, I absolutely is the would. media Peter, aware of this guy? I mean, well, like when you, when, no, that's when, a really good question. When you that's were a, at, at Sky or, for example, the BBC, because actually, you know, they're mm. all pretty much much. Yeah, they Sky are. BBC, ITV. I wonder whether they are re, they realise how disliked they are by many people, mm. or whether they ha, do they think they have authority still, or what? Uh, every day, I get my viewing figures at GB News. You know, time for tragedy, but there is this daily tyranny of viewing figures, which I detest, but also, uh, uh, you know, acutely feel the necessity because it's this umbilical connection with the viewer. I think there was a time I went literally years at Sky without knowing what my viewing figures were. And that tells you quite a lot, I yes. think. Yes. Um, I mean, tell, OK, it partly means I'm working for, a, you know, a, a, a ruthless, driven uh, media organisation that's in this existential struggle for survival, but it does mean you've got that connection as well. I think people are real, increasingly realise, and Brexit magnified this hugely, that you, you as I said recently in a, in a monologue, you know, we, we arrive at the truth adversarially or disputationally, and we do it in the courts, we do it in Parliament, we do it in newspapers, and this idea that we suspended that arrangement 80, 90 years ago with the formation of the BBC, I think people increasingly recognise that that's an anachronism. Yes. And as you say, it's for the BBC, see Sky, see ITV, that it's, it's all much of a muchness. Um, and what's it, one of the, the fascinating features of what of this emerge, evolving media landscape is, you know, you know what happens now? Is there, is there a role actually for uh, a, a, a third party who will pass the news on your behalf? Mm. Or, or is it all direct via Twitter from the individual direct to the customer. I mean, we are still sitting in the middle, um, but I think we can regain some confidence. I, I often think back to Rupert Murdoch's um, evidence to the Media Select Committee in the wake of the closure of the News of the World, when he said, look, I, you, you think we're awful, you think we're monsters at the News of the World, but if you think we are, just have a look what's behind us, those barbarians online at the gate. Yeah. You know, I've got trained journalists working for me, we abide by a set of rules. There are no rules out there in the Wild West. So I hope that part of what GB News can do is actually regain some of that trust yeah. because we will be offering something that's not just Guardian, Daily Mirror, BBC, Sky. We will offer something that's, you know, some genuine cognitive diversity. I mean, this, uh, what you are offering or what you wanted to offer, it seems to have been, you know, basically the bone of contention when it came to Andrew Neil's departure. Isn't that right? Well, look, I, I, I don't want to get into that, but I, I, do, I do think it's, re it's reasonable to point out that uh, there are, if you look at the roster of presenters and you look at the output across the piece, there is a, it's, it's pretty Catholic. Mm. You know, there, there is, uh, you know, the people like Gloria, ex-Labour MP, um, Liam Halligan, in his own way, offers it some, yes. you know, quite striking uh, departures. Uh, Alistair Stewart, Simon McCoy. These are not these are not ideologues. No, no. Um, uh, and there are some some other presenters: Inaya Flara and Imam, really thoughtful. Mercy Maroki, um, with uh, some really thoughtful approaches to the news and quite original perspectives. And I, and I think that, you know, this this idea we were just unloading yeah. you know, this sort of ideological download is, is, is wrong. Did you, did you know Andrew Neil before? No, we, 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 <laughs> no, we no. Close, Great right? admirer, yes. you know, read, read his autobiography, Full Disclosure, you know, when it was published. And uh, I remember thinking, you know, the bravery of this guy, I mean, when the, tri the print unions were stacking up empty coffins in his front garden, I mean, the intimidation. Of course, I, you know, started in newspapers and these stories were legion of, you know, the intimidation by the print unions and, but obviously Wapping was a different, a completely, you know, far worse situation uh, that he was dealing with. Um, uh, you know, in, hu huge admiration, mm. you know, finest journalist of his, TV journalist of his generation. Mm. You know. Yes, yes. Well, you have your show now and 
I just wonder, when you look to the future and you say well, you hope that GBs will address the balance, and I think you said at one point that it was the sort of thing that uh, a democracy would need, I, a, a channel like this. It's a necessity now. Um, we've certainly been talking about it for f 15 years, and we are saying before we came on air, uh, that you know, this is obviously necessary. When, when do you think, what would be success, as it were, in the future, do you think? And it's a difficult one, but I mean, how would you measure the influence? How, how could you say, to, ah, right now we have, we have actually, this is what we are doing. What, what, when would that, hmm. what would that be? It's a really good question, and I should have an answer for it, really, Peter. <laughs> you know, because there's a story, isn't there? Yes. There's a story yes. that's treated in a certain way yeah. that, will be, that, that we will see in a year or five years that isn't being... That, that just couldn't be possible now. I mean, you know, you mentioned the, the monologue about PC Keith Blakelock. I mean, it's un unconscionable mm. I could have done that at Sky. Oh, yes, yeah. I yeah, mean, totally, yeah, yeah. totally. Um, I did another monologue uh, the week before. 200,000 people watched it on Twitter, talking ostensibly about Greta Thunberg, but actually it was a love letter to the Industrial Revolution and our sense of institutional in indifference to the achievements of it. Uh, you know, and as somebody who grew up in Bradford, still remembering the, you know, the, so the, the, the blackened chimneys and, and that failure to recognise the achievements of our ancestors. Um, again, that would have been utterly unthinkable at Sky. So we, we are nudging the dial. And I think the key, the key takeaway is that um, the fact that Rupert Murdoch has decided to reassess mm. in the wake of GB News mm. launching and he's seeing what we do, we, we do. Uh, and I think, <clears throat> you know, Whatever the commercial prospects of his channel or ours are, I think he's decided that he he can he can be an entrant to that conversation, mm. and I think that's wonderful. Where does this also? There are sort of implications, aren't there, for Ofcom in this? Because I remember that when when we first started, uh, ooh, fifteen years ago, there was this thing called Eighteen Doughty Street, uh, and it was done online, mm. right, via a website because mm. there was no YouTube at the time, uh, but. The point was always made, oh, we have Ofcom, which means we can't do uh, opinionated uh, news. Well, um, you sort of proved that's not the case, isn't it? We are very cognizant of Ofcom rules. I mean, you know, yeah, we've, yeah. All, we've all done the training. We, we, you know, there, there is clearly a separation. You know, if you, if you put firewalls around things, editorial firewalls around what you're doing, and you make it perfectly clear that this is opinion, this is analysis, and this is news, and maybe by the time this goes to air, we'll have started our firewall, ring-fenced news bulletins. And, uh, you know, that's part of the offering because people have been saying to us, you know, we want to see, you know, how do we catch up on the news? We want to see a more traditional linear news bulletin. So that's coming. But that will be apart from, you know, my monologues or, you know, what Dan Wooden does in the evening. And that's and it's been that separation, that ability to separate and say, actually, we are we are editorialising and this is subjective. Um, it's 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 not news, strictly speaking. Um, it's a it's a type of news that um, that has allowed us to do it. Well, it's not unlike the comment, the comment pages of newspapers. I mean, what is the difference? You know, they are hugely prominent now, aren't they? It's mm. the point where most people actually, many people actually, just look at that uh, when they want to get get their news. Um, just finally, kind of, I wonder. You spent a long time in in television journalism, of course, and we've talked about the monologues, we've talked about GB News. What difference has it made to you to be able to express your own self? Mm. What difference has it made to you? Is it, I don't know yet. I don't. Sorry? I don't know yet. You don't. <laughs> no, I but mean, I mean in terms no. of you, is it a relief? I no, mean, totally. No, totally. And. Uh, I say I don't know yet because the, it is a selfish gamble that I've taken. You know, I mean, my eldest daughter said to me, Dad, you, you've abandoned your children. <laughs> you know, I spend the week in London. I miss my children. It aches. You know, there is an ache. Uh, I, I've made, a, you know, a Faustian pact, which is I just think in the scheme of things, I'm doing my kids a favour by being part of this important project. Yes. And I shave in the mirror and I can stand up straight and look myself in the eye and you know uh, it was a grubby compact taking the shilling going along with things I just couldn't agree with uh, for this for the sake of keeping the domestic show on the road as I, I now you know look at myself shaving and think okay I can uh, I can stand up straight 
Great. Well, look, uh, all the very best Thank uh, you, Peter. For, for the show. Uh, that's Radio, which is on, you probably know this already, I'm sure, <laughs> at uh, 8 o'clock uh, in the evening. Uh, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Peter. On, uh, Colin. Uh, that's it for this week on So What You're Saying Is, and we will doubtless see you next time. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.